those of you who are able, please stand and join me in the call of worship. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of heaven and earth. God sits above the circle of the earth and stretches out the heavens like a curtain. Those who wait for the Lord shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. How good it is to sing praises to our God. in God, you stretch the sky over our heads like a canopy filled with twinkling lights. Scarcely do the stems of our lives take root before the wind comes, I'm sorry, but the wind carries us away like stubble. Yet you care for us, healing the brokenhearted, gathering the outcast, lifting the downtrodden, while casting the wicked to the ground. Renew our strength this day, O God, that we may mount up with wings like edges. I'm, I'm sorry, like eagles. Amen.
scripture passage comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 16 through 23. Hear now God's word. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this on my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that I might, by all means, save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. God of strength, we confess that when we grow weary, we often turn to artificial means of support instead of turning to you. We realize that you, you alone are our rock and our fortress. God of justice, we confess that we are outraged and angry. And we turn to name-calling and backstabbing and demonize others instead of waiting for you to pull us up from the pit. God of grace, we confess our reluctance in accepting others for who they are and your eternal embrace that welcomes all people. Forgive us for not trusting you. Lord, lead us as we live out your calling on our lives in ways in which we can share the good news with others. Amen. Last Sunday in um, worship, we talked about chapter 8 in 1 Corinthians and how the Apostle Paul recognized that he was free as a Christian, he had certain freedoms, but he was also keenly aware of his responsibility as a Christian, and he didn't want to become a stumbling block for someone else. In the ninth chapter, Paul offers himself as a living illustration, proclaiming the gospel. He's a living testimony, so to speak. He concludes in chapter 10 by saying, Whether therefore you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, and give no occasion for stumbling either to Jews or to Greeks or to the assembly of God, even though I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved, be imitators of me, even as I also am of Christ. So let me ask you a question. Do people know that you're a Christian? Yeah? So let me ask you the second question. How do they know that you're a Christian? I have to chuckle. I read a comic strip, and it had a police officer pulling over this man. And on the back of his car was one of those Christian fishes, those ichthuses, and a bumper sticker that says, follow me to church where you can really feel that Jesus loves you. The officer went up to the driver's window, and um, he said, Good afternoon, sir. Do you know why I'm pulling you over? 
To which the man replied, Officer, I have no clue. The officer proceeds to ask the man if this is his vehicle. To which he said, why, yeah, it's, it's my car. He said, well, I thought someone must have stolen your car. He said, I saw the symbol on the back of your car and your bumper sticker, but I also saw you flipping the bird to that person over there as you cut them off. And he said, and I saw you screaming at the people around you. He said, when I saw that bumper sticker in the ichthus, he said, I knew someone had to have stolen your car. Hmm. We're known by the things that we do as well as the things that we don't do. We know that Paul, formerly known as Saul, had a conversion experience on the road to Damascus. He was blind, and then these scales fell off of his eyes, and he could see. It was a spiritual experience. We know that he persecuted Christians. He killed them. And he himself, through this conversion experience, became a Christ follower. And even though many of us have not had a blinding experience like Paul, and we don't have this elaborate story like Paul, we have many conversion experiences, like little things that happen to us all the time. Just like when Janine said, what is that inside of you? that prompts you not to say, not now, just hold on, just wait a minute. Or, hey, go over and see if that person needs some help. Or say hi to somebody. You know, here's the problem. The problem is many of us like to keep our faith to ourselves. And the problem in keeping our faith to ourselves is that we can't be the body of Christ or the church without evangelism. C.S. Lewis wrote a book, The Screwtape Letters, and he said that evil in our world rarely begins in horrible dens of wickedness, or the unspeakable hell of concentration camps, or the slaughter that takes place in war. Instead, he said evil begins in the office corridors, It begins in government bureaucracies and in classrooms where the system does away with personal stories. When no one can tell another's passion or their heart, they just become this cog in a wheel. The machine grinds away at truth until it's scattered to the winds, and then any old lie will do. Lewis said the only way to find truth again is when people begin to recover and tell their personal stories. And the telling of stories, it's truth. The truth in our life that begins to matter. And this is the choice of the Apostle Paul. When he wrote the Corinthians, he says, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. You see, there are certain elements in the gospel that Paul uses to spread it. The first one is authenticity. In some faith traditions, coming into a faith relationship with God is like being haunted, not hunted, into a relationship. As United Methodists, we call this provenient grace. You see, God woos us. Even though we're not really aware that it's God, God is like knocking on our door. God is courting us. He's saying, I'm here. He noticed me. And he keeps showing up again and again. Emily Dickinson once wrote it like this. Art is a house that tries to be haunted. And what she meant is that artistic skills only come alive when there is this creative spirit that's living within us. Often we pretend to be secular of the world and we function just fine apart from God. Yet in reality, our houses, our bodies, our temples are begging to be haunted 
We are empty shells that needs the inner warmth of the divine spirit. And we come alive when the spirit resides in us. Michelangelo noticed this huge block of white marble in the pile of discards. He noticed that it had a nice color, it had good texture, but the artists that rejected it did so because it was so misshapen, its shape was awkward. Yet from the dis this discarded stone, Michelangelo was able to carve out his famous statue of David. Somewhere, someone knew that the statue had come from the discarded pile. And he asked him this question, how did you ever do this, he replied. He says, I saw David in there. I saw David in that block of stone. And little by little, month after month, I cut away everything that wasn't David. You know, that's kind of like how God is artistically creative in our lives. We need the skills of the great artist, God, to see the truth in our lives. And then slowly, and sometimes painfully, God begins to cut away the things that aren't really us. So we can see our true character. God takes away the things that weighs us down, the things that give us odd shape and form, and creates in us his own image. When you think back over the years, or even maybe the last couple months, what or who has helped to shape you as a Christian? As I thought about my own life, I remember as a young child, probably four or five years old, going to church with my mother and my grandmother. Sometimes it was just me and my grandmother. I loved going to church because afterwards I always knew that we would go to Frisch's to eat. And she would splurge, do you want to share a piece of strawberry pie or hot fudge cake? Well, of course, what kid didn't want to do that? But the best part is that she would drive down the road and we would sing at the top of our lungs, brighten the corner where you are. Do you know that song? It's not in our hymn, no. But we would sing that and sing it and we'd sing other hymns, the old rugged cross. And as I got older, I thought more and more about those words. Even now, as I listen to songs and I have my grandchildren with me, I have to admit, I love it when Hope says to me, hey, put the Lauren Daigle CD in. And she sings to the, in the top of her lungs, who do you say that I am? It opens up the door for me. At night, when we, before we go to bed, we do kind of like an examination of soul. I ask Hope, who do you think God says you are? I have to ask myself that question. Who do you think God says you are? Can you hear God's voice or feel the Holy Spirit move within you? There are times when music speaks of bigger things. Music tells of a love deeper than feelings, a courage that is broader than our bravery, a beauty that's richer than appearance. That's the divine presence of God working in and through us. When we sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, what is it that stirs deep within you? Now, I can tell you that that song holds meaning to people. When I served at Otter by Lebanon, and I went out to the, hall, to the um, assisted living and in the hallways and would gather people to come and worship on Friday morning, we would sing, Jesus loves me, and they didn't have to look at their hymnals. The smile on their face, 
the countenance in their posture, you could tell they knew that Jesus loved them and each and every person there. You know what's interesting? The church, through our music, teaches us God's name and also God's character. We have heard the music that heals and soothes our very souls. We have come to the waters that cleanse us, and we've come to the river where we pray. We know that the water that quenches our parched and dry, thirsty souls. We have found a place of feasting and forgiveness, and we have found a place where we are transformed from stone to a creation that God knows and sees intimately. What image do you have in your mind when you think about the gospel of Jesus Christ? How do you offer Jesus to someone? Do you see the gospel as a burning fire or do you see it as an invitation and a place where others can come to the table? Perhaps one of the reasons that, that the church is not able to bring people to faith is that its image of the gospel is all wrong. Rather than being energized by the Spirit of God in all the ways that God is working and moving and inviting someone to new life and relationship, it reduces the gospel to a formal ethical setting where there's judgment and rigidness and condemning. Who wants to be hypocritical? What if Paul says there's this wonderful playness, playfulness about God's wooing in our lives and it comes out in our conversations with others? Whether it's how we drive our vehicles or how we talk about others, you see it all matters. Because we are living testimonies of our faith, good, bad, or indifferent. Have you ever been someplace where another person opens up and starts telling you their life story? That's happened to me when I've been at the nail salon. And it wasn't the person that was working on my nails, it was the person sitting next to me. It could be a line in a supermarket. Or maybe it's at work. Or maybe you're talking with someone after you've seen a movie and it begins to open up a conversation. Maybe someone has shared their most difficult times or their heartache. You listen, or maybe you don't. But what I've noticed is the expression on people's faces where their eyes seem to go. And what I've noticed is that inside of me, I want to tell that person, Jesus loves you just like he loves me. And then I try to find where God is showing up and how I might be able to relate. Last week, Janine shared how she's trying to find this perfect home for a young mom with, what, three to four, I don't know how many kids, she, four kids, and she's going through a divorce. That touched me. I prayed every day that God would use Janine to find that perfect house. And I prayed that this young woman would not be discouraged, that God would give her strength, and help her to navigate this journey. I also prayed that God would lead her to a faith family. Jesus never said, well, this isn't how it happens in the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus went to the woman at the well. He meets us where we are. He offered her living water. You see, Jesus left the 99 sheep for that one lost sheep. That's who God is. He's wooing us. He's searching for us. He's offering us lasting relationships. He will never 
walk away from us and leave us orphaned. He is encouraging us to share our stories with each other. He notices changes in our lives and he encourages us to speak up and to tell our stories. Somewhere, your life has been sandwiched between people who have prayed you up, have prayed for you, and have seen you at your best and at your worst. And they want you to know that God is with you. Sandwiches speak of community. A sandwich carries its substance between slices of bread so that it won't slip away. And it's right there in our fingertips. Sometimes evangelism is like a sandwich. And sometimes it's kind of got a bad name and it's like a cell job. When something is sold, you deliberately put distance between yourself and what it is that you're selling. You don't get attached to it. Steve Martin portrays this in a movie that um, speaks about, portrays this flashy evangelist who operates from a billion watt showbiz stage and the church gets a bad name for cheap tricks and the people are hoodwinked by false promises and then they're talked out of their money. And when they turn up broken and needy, they are shifted out into the streets. That's not this church. So why are you here today? What brought you to church and what keeps you part of it? Statistically, if you read what brings people to church, you will hear them say that it was a direct result of a meaningful personal relationship with someone in that congregation. 80% are sandwiched between people who cared about them, prayed for them, asked about them, and they knew that God was important to the people that sandwiched them in. Did you know that seven out of 10 people who don't presently attend worship service seriously consider doing so? And do you know how this happens? That they come to church? It's when someone asks them. You see, our Christian faith is shared between people who care about each other. Here's a third truth about the gospel. There's a cost that comes with Christian faith. You were bought, I was bought, we were all bought with a price. Jesus loves us so much that he died on a cross while we are still sinners. There's a time and a choice, an hour of decision, as Billy Graham puts it. It's not enough that we're wooed and we're sandwiched by other believers. At some point, the way that we look at things must change. It's what we call conversion. It's not just a one-time experience. You see, it happens continually. It's called a spiritual change or evolution. We're being molded by grace. And there we find hope and healing and wholeness. And the story of the man in the Bible who threw a wedding party and invited guests who refused to come and then told his messengers to go out into the streets and invite people, gives us a little glimpse of what it's like to evangelize for the church. Then the man who threw the party had clothing for everyone to wear, but there was this one man who came and didn't wear the garb that was offered. And he was thrown out. It must have been hard for the host because he wanted them there in the first place. You see, the host's welcome never wavered, but the man wanted to do it his way on his own terms. Jesus said this isn't how it happens in the kingdom of heaven. Either there's a change that takes place in your life or you don't belong because you have no story to tell. 
Evangelism is more than talking about Jesus and inviting people to believe. It's also about changing circumstances in ways that reflect God's kingdom. It refers to the fact that God took a piece of himself and made it human. He didn't stay separated or distanced, distanced or removed from human situations or humans themselves. Instead, Jesus came and joined in with us. He's right there in every situation. He helps us to see what it could be. God came to you and he came to me and he comes to each and every one of us in our joys and in our sufferings. And we know that every moment is a moment of grace, every hour an offering to be shared. Our lives no longer belong to us alone because they belong to everyone who desperately needs to hear our story. And that's why we cannot keep silent, especially where there's human suffering. For neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. You, you and I have a story to tell. And God will provide the opportunity. So take courage and let us all speak of the goodness of God. Amen. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. On page 13, amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, he broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. 
By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast in his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, and with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <coughs> This is the body of Christ, broken for you. Take and eat and remember. This is the blood of Christ, shed for you. Take and drink and remember. Receive now the benediction. Be all things to all people and share the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.